Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Bridget Martin. I'm the Croft Assistant Professor of Anthropology and Korean Studies. Um, so incredibly pleased to introduce to you uh, Jasmine Miller and Anya Groner and their talk, Jones Land, a Legacy of Extraction and Survival. Um, the talk focuses on, from my understanding, the intersection of plantation geographies, petrochemical geographies, and geographies of black kinship and survival in southeastern Louisiana. Um, it is co-sponsored by the Center for the Study of Southern Culture and the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Special thanks to Ethan Thomas and uh, Simone Delerme for helping us put this visit together. Um, so Anya Groner is, uh, in addition to being an old friend of mine, she is an award-winning journalist, a fiction writer, and essayist who has published in outlets such as The Atlantic, The New York Times, Guernica, Oxford American. Um, she also has an MFA from this university in creative writing. Um, she teaches creative writing at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, and she's also the co-founder of the New Orleans Writers Workshop. Um, Jasmine Miller is a theater artist and the executive director of Carpenter Arts Garden in Memphis, which if you haven't heard of, you should check out. Um, she's also a documentary filmmaker, and she's currently working on a film called Jonesland, uh, which is about her family's land in St. James Parish, Louisiana. And we're gonna be able to see some advanced clips of that today, which is a real privilege. Um, I just met Jazzy yesterday, but I feel like I already know her because she's also the subject of two episodes of the new Monument Lab, uh, podca Monument Lab podcast called Plot of Land, which I use in my geography uh, class, Geography 101. Um, so, uh, and Anya is also a reporter on that podcast. So if you haven't heard of it, I think they're gonna play clips too, but if you haven't heard of it, definitely check it out. Um, probably really good for this, this audience. Uh, um, so lastly, I guess maybe some of you are wondering why Korean studies professor is introducing speakers about <laughs> Louisiana. But I just wanna say that from my, in my capacity as a geographer, I find this story really fascinating and important it's not only a story about land commodification, environmental racism, and many of the issues we deal with in geography, it's also a story about place. It's a story about uh, how people make the future that they want to live in, mm -hmm. in the places where they are, and how the meaning of place can change over time and through successive genera generations. Um, it's a really beautiful story, so please join me in welcoming <laughs> Um, so actually, thank you so much for that for that wonderful intro, and thank you to um, Southern Studies and all the departments that are supporting us. It's it's I can't tell you actually how fun it is to be back here after having gone to grad school here to come back in this capacity, which is not at all the way I expected to come back here, and I can't imagine a better way to be here to get us started today. So. Um, Jazzy and I have been collaborating in all kinds of ways. So um, I was a guest on her documentary. She and then I was like, well, you have an amazing story, but I don't want to steal it from you. But I also really want to tell it. And so I started doing this this podcast. And I said, is there a way that I can tell you tell this wonderful story you have, which you are about to learn um, th that lifts you up? You know, that's not another case of extraction and, and exploitation, but that lifts you up and that um, so that we can tell the story together. Um, and so that turned into the podcast. Now we have an exhibit together. So we are just, um, I don't know, I don't know what's happening. We're like multimedia, sort of like creativity just going in all There's directions. There's so many things going on, you have no idea. Um, but I wanna start with just a clip from the podcast so you can get a flavor of that and you'll hear some of the questions that were, that at least that podcast, which is um, really interested in American land use practices, is asking. And then you'll also hear like the very personal questions that Jazzy's asking, but I think that'll start us off. There's a saying that land is power. And it's interesting because I feel that at 35 years old, I've just come to terms, I've just um, felt the impact for myself of what that means. It feels like a prophecy has been spoken over a place that is already spiritual, but it's, but it's dark, it's heavy, and it's something that we didn't decide.
Hey, it's Jamila. Over the course of 10 episodes, I'm joining our team of five reporters throughout the U.S. As we pull back the curtain to look at how our history with land has shaped every aspect of our lives. It's a tricky thing, land. Our very existence is critically tied to it. And yet we don't all get equal access. Why? How exactly did we get to this moment in time? We'll break down how race, class, and power have been used to build and maintain unfair systems that determine how land is used. These systems harm nearly everyone and create so many inequities that they might seem normal, unavoidable, or even natural. But these are the products of deliberate choices made by real people. It's time to reckon with these decisions. It's time to understand this history so we can help build a just future for everybody. This is a Monument Lab production with funding from the Ford Foundation and music by Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Jamila Hammond, and this is Plot of Land. Now we want to look at Louisiana, at a 66-acre piece of family land called Jones Land. There, a movement of historically black communities is fighting for survival against some of the most powerful and wealthy petrochemical plants. And that family land, Jones Land, it belongs to Jasmine Miller's family. My name is Jasmine Miller. In the theater world, people call me Jazzy. So Jazzy Miller is my most common name because I'm a theater director in Memphis, Tennessee, where I work for Crosstown Arts. Born and raised in Memphis, but of course my my mother's family's roots are here in St. James, Louisiana. St. James Parish is 258 square miles and since its founding in 1807 has seen extractive industries exploit the lives of millions. In 2020, Jazzy began making a documentary film there, taking trips back to her family's home place, Jonesland. Jonesland is unusual. Jazzy's family has raised generations of children on the same piece of land for more than a century. Through slavery and reconstruction, through an oil boom, and an onslaught of petrochemical refining and manufacturing, Jazzy's family has persisted, finding joy and spirituality in the land and each other, even as their very existence is regularly threatened. And in America, centuries of discriminatory land use and lending practices have left Black people owning just half a percent of farmland across the country. So how did the Jones family, who have worked their land for generations, come to own 66 acres in part of a country notorious for exploiting and displacing Black people? And how did they manage to hold on to it? but I'm a storyteller. I just want to tell the story. But I have to know the story first, right? Where are we in this history? So um, documentary filmmaker, once upon a time, aspiring documentary filmmaker, because what you should know is that I'm very much a theater person. Um, I grew up doing theater, um, weird theater kid. Uh, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, Um, went to Rhodes College, did mission work through my 20s, and traveled a show on the life of Sojourner Truth. Chose her because she was over six feet tall. I'm over six feet tall. You know, we got that in common, and plus she has an incredible story. Um, But but I also have a really incredible family, Um, and we we share this kinship that is, um, that's just, that's, that I always felt was so unique. You know, I'd spend the year in Memphis, Tennessee. That's where I was born and raised. Um, And we'd have this thing growing up called uh, going to your cousins for the summer. So our cousins from from the Jones property um, would come up the river and they'd stay with my brother and I. And uh, and reversely, I'd go down the river and go hang out with my cousins down there on the Jones property and in Lemonville. And life was freaking sweet. I mean, we would just ride our bikes down the lane. We'd um, eat at everyone's houses. We'd fall asleep on the porch. We'd fish off the batcher, um, which I'm I'm not even so sure we can do that anymore. But um, everyone knew everyone. Um, The adults always knew where you were. Uh, We shared. um, And and, and there was so much closeness. Not knowing that, um, that that predated me, right? That's how my mom grew up. She grew up on this property. That's how her dad grew up. He grew up on that property. That's how his dad grew up. He grew up on that property. 
And you know, growing up, I'd begun to wonder, like, how far back does this go? Um, what's the story here? And so 2013 rolls around. We hear these whisperings of, oh, there's oil on the land, there's oil on the land, and these people have shown up, and they want to drill for it. And when you don't know anything about oil, like me, um, like, like, you know, like my brother, we're going, you know, well, we're, we're about to be rich. They're about to drill for this oil, and um, there's 3,000 or more of us, and we're all going to, like, be millionaires, right? Um, no, right, that was, not, that was never going to happen. But, um, but the, so, so this comes up. And the people still living on the property, which, you know, most of them are in their 80s and 90s, were all related, they're not flinching. Like, they know, um, they already knew that it was there, um, and they never talked about it. And so this is just, you know, this question of, I had so many questions just sort of looming over me. And um, I want to say 2020 rolled around, everything happened that y'all know about, you know, um, the world shut down. And I was the director of a venue uh, at Crosstown and um, I had a really incredible coworker and I'm going, man, this is a perfect time while we're closed. I really just want to ask these questions. But you know, it's, I, I, I did a semester at film school. It, it had been eons. I, did, I didn't know a lot about the new technologies, all the things that you come up with, like why you're so in, insufficient to do a thing. And I'm just like, man, Justin, I, I can't do it. He's like, I think that you should just do it. I think that you should just rent some equipment and just do it. I got your back. Um, and that man is sitting in the back of the room and is hating right now that I'm bringing that up, but, but I'm doing it. So thank you, Justin, because now we're here, right? Um, and so, uh, so I went down there with a camera and I set it up in the family church and I just started asking some questions and I started with oil. Um, and, I and I also led with, uh, how far back in, in your family tree can you go? Everybody gets to this woman named Sudonia Dennis, who was born in 1862. Um, I think everyone in the room knows what it was like in the South uh, around 1862 and what was significant, what was happening. Uh, that was she, she indeed was born in Louisiana, uh, born maybe in, on or around the Jones property. We don't know. So many we don't knows. Um, but there's Sidonia Dennis. Uh, we own this land. We've had it since 1923. All stories lead back to her that she was, you know, the matriarch that sort of um, uh, pulled, this, pulled this, this deal together using her sons, of which she had nine, and she had two daughters, uh, to get this property, and, uh, and everyone gets a place to live, right? Um, so, so there's that too. There's black ownership. This is a very rare thing, right, in the South that black people own land, um, you know, that early in the 1900s. It's, it's really clear why Jazzy is here. Um, this is her family story. The, the way that I got introduced to this story is that um, I was driving along River Road in Louisiana, and that's the road that goes right by the levee. There's the, the Mississippi's on the other side of it. And I was with my dog, like looking for, I don't know, just a place to explore with my dog. And I'd heard this is plantation country. People had told me that. I live in New Orleans. I know there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of tourism around plantation country. But what I actually saw wasn't plantations as much as petrochemical plants. Um, and if you've never seen a petrochemical plant, they are really intense. I mean, they look like entire dystopian cities. The scale at which they operate um, is not a human scale. Right, everything dwarfs you. That just the holding containers are like the size of football fields, um, and so I started asking this question: like, how is it that these came to exist and this place, and what are they? So I started doing this story for the Atlantic um, about this plant, the Formosa Plastics plant, that was supposed to move into St. James Parish, and if it was built, it would have been a 9.4 billion dollar megaplex of plastics facilities. Um, it would have been the biggest uh, fossil fuel emitter in the in the Western Hemisphere and the biggest plastics plant in the world. Um, and you know, so I started like looking into this story and interviewing this woman named Sharon Levine, who was at the time was 70. She was a retired special ed teacher, um, and she was like, "No, they're not going to come here. This is they live. This is a mile from my house. I'm going to stop them from coming here." And I'm like, "That's great." But you know, this is like $9.4 billion they have invested in this. And you know, I was like sort of wondering how this is going to happen um, and got really invested in this story. 
And in the process of doing land surveys, what they found is unmarked burial sites on the land. Um, and if you if you drive along River Road, you're going to see, you know, the, all the sugarcane fields, and then you're going to see these lone trees in the middle of the sugarcane fields, and those often are unmarked burial sites of enslaved people because enslaved people were not allowed to be buried in the same sites as white people. So they were often buried by some kind of natural object, right? Natural a tree or something like that. So they're they're often marked. So when people are building these petrochemical plants, right? They don't they uh, they don't the land surveys, let's say, have not always acknowledged the anomalies in the soil that would indicate that there is a burial site. But it was discovered that there was a burial site. Um, and they, they had a big Juneteenth ceremony at the burial site. They had to go to court to even have access to the burial site. But in Louisiana, you do have the right to see your ancestor's grave site. Um, so they went there and they got, they, you know, it was middle of the pandemic. They posted it on Facebook Live and, and really got a lot of international attention. Um, so they're sort of making this cultural argument and they're also making legal arguments. And they did in fact successfully stop the Formosa plant. And I won't get into all the details of how, but it was, it was many, many lawsuits. Um, so they stopped it. And so I started you know, thinking about this question of, of extraction. So like, what is extraction? Why is petrochemical even interested in this region? So the word extraction for me it initially you know it conjures up images of like pulling oil up from the ground which is absolutely a form of extraction but it's really like pulling any natural resource whatsoever for profit i mean it is like a uh, it is capitalism on steroids right it is like really using as much of a resource until it's gone um, so if you think about louisiana the history of extraction there goes back hundreds of years, right? It was, it's all marshland that was filled in, all of the forests were cut down, um, enslaved people had to cut them down and make that into agricultural land. You know, then there's like the 12.5 the million people who are brought across the Atlantic, um, kidnapped and, and sold in the slave trade. And then once sugarcane, um, which for a long time you couldn't grow in Louisiana until um, a plantation owner sort of crossed, crossed varieties of it and came up with a hybrid that would work, um, so that was a very labor intensive process. So then they started selling people south for that process. And all along, this is just extraction after extraction, right? People moving against their will, the labor like literally extracted from their bodies. If you started working in a sugarcane um, field, if you were an enslaved laborer, you had seven to 10 years left to live once you started doing that work. That's how intense the labor was. Um, the sugarcane itself, is, is very, very labor intensive with machetes and you know, boiling, boiling it down. So it's a, it's a hard crop um, and it's a very lucrative crop. So when I say you're extracting to get as much resource as possible, um, Louisiana at one point had the highest concentration of millionaires in the United States because they were plantation owners. And we don't think of Louisiana as a wealthy state, but there was a time when it, when it held the wealthiest people in the United States and they had you know their plantations and big houses um, so then so slavery um, ends people start sharecropping and then oil is discovered in Louisiana and oil is discovered in 1901 and when they discover it um, people are rushing it they're realizing right like the the sugar economy is crashing and they are realizing that this is the next big thing and people start putting up oil derricks like side by side, like it looked like forests of derricks because they're literally trying to pump the, the oil out faster than each other. And there's really wild pictures of like um, roughnecks, you know, like digging, digging holes as fast as they can so they can have an, a pond to fill for the, a place, just a place for the oil to go because it's coming out so fast. And they have people on boats on these, <laughs> on these like pools of oil. Um, with their rifles so they can shoot birds because they don't want the birds to clog up the works. Um, it, was a, it was a wild, wild time. And as the oil started to become more and more you know, available throughout Louisiana and people started to cash into that, they also needed a place to put their refineries. Um, and so that became the new use for, for this region. Uh, but it's also known for something else. Um, this, very same region is also often called Cancer Alley. Um, and the, the reason, the, the, the story of why it's called Cancer Alley, well, I'll tell you, it's got 
Along the Mississippi River, there are more than 200 petrochemical plants that are in operation. It has the highest concentration of petrochemical in the United States, possibly even the world. Louisiana has a quarter of our nation's petrochemical plants. So if you think about like what is a sacrifice zone, Cancer Alley is a sacrifice zone. That is a, that is a place where industry has been prioritized so much over environment and people um, that, that it's, it's talked freely, I mean, not even with shame, that, that that's what the role that it plays. Mm -hmm. So in 1987, a pharmacist in um, Donaldsonville started noticing that many of her friends and relatives were miscarrying their babies. Um, so she started just doing sort of an informal survey and noticing how many people were miscarrying and it was an alarming rate. So she published this information at the same time in Chalmette, Louisiana, um, there's a, a, a two block area and 15 people on two blocks had cancer. So this information starts getting out and there's a walk that happens from Baton Rouge to New Orleans, Greenpeace is involved, um, and they really start calling it Cancer Alley and they demand that the state does something. Now, if you're in public health, you're probably thinking like, okay, well, if these claims are being made, then we have to check to see you know, what, what are the cancer rates, right? What is in the air? I will tell you, so that was in 1988, it was called Cancer Alley. Not until 2022 did a study come out saying definitively that there is a higher rate of cancer in this region caused by petrochemical. Um, and and I, I can get a, I can get into all the, all, detail, all the details later about how that happened, but for there to be that incredible lapse of time for something like that um, is, a, is, is real data injustice, right? I mean, even for somebody to be able to say, there's 15 cancer cases on my two block, you know, in two blocks, you know, it, it brings up the question of what is data and what do we listen, who do we listen to, what data matters? Um, so anyway, so this is, this is the area that is called Cancer Alley. It really runs from um, just a little bit south of New Orleans all the way up to Baton Rouge and a little bit beyond Baton Rouge. And here, um, in case you haven't seen a petrochemical plant, this is uh, an image of one from above. And it's really hard to see the tiny little cars on the roads, but it, see if you can pick one out, because that's the scale that we're talking about. Those holding tanks, the big white circles, um, are like the size of a football field, each one. And they are not tightly concealed um, because they can't be. It would be dangerous. You know, the gases expand and contract, so they have to be able to move. But it also means when hurricanes come through, as they do, like Hurricane Ida a couple years ago, like all, everything inside can, you know, can, can come out. Um, and there are people that are living and, and schools that are within a one mile radius of, of places like this. In fact, just in um, St. John the Baptist Parish, which is downriver from St. James, there's a place called Reserve, and they have, they make neoprene. So if you've ever used a, a koozie, which I'm guessing most people in this room have, that's neoprene. They only make it in one place in the country. It's in St. John the Baptist Parish. And in the process of making neoprene, they, they release this chemical called chloroprene, which is a cancer-causing chemical. The rate in Reserve is 700 times the healthy limit. Um, and nowhere else in the United States, there were other plants, they've all been shut down for health consequences. So I'm, I'm just bringing this up to see, sort of just to see the scope of the problem. Um, this is not subtle when you're in Louisiana, you know, you see it, you see it, it's really in your face. And, and the longer you're there, the more people you know who are dealing with this kind of stuff. So um, I'm gonna turn it, well, actually, I'll just say one last thing. So Jazzy contacted me right after this article came out, she was working on her documentary, um, and that's how we, we ended up. Well, yeah, so that's actually where I was going to pick up. So, um, so I'm doing interviews. I'm really interested in genealogy and history of the land, but one thing that keeps coming up during the interviews um, is that um, petrochemical cancer rates, um, funerals, death, and uh, what do I do as a storyteller who's looking for something specific? I don't really want to talk about that stuff like let's get to the let's get to the thing when really that is the thing it keeps popping back up in every interview that I'm conducting and so um, so I'm driving along my mom's in the car it's 7 a.m. one morning and I'm like you know I pull over and I'm thinking um, we were at a site 
near Mosaic that was, uh, that was really significant. And I'm thinking, I've got this kind of camera. Justin says, this is good for B-roll. I'll get out and get some B-roll. So I got out and I set the camera up and um, 37 seconds later, because that's the time stamp on the footage, squad car rolls around at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning. I'm like, what are you doing? Are you like waiting for people to come and get, like, what's the deal? Um, and at first I wasn't really sure if they were there for me, um, which they were. And um, he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting footage of, of, this, of this place. And he says, why? And I said, I'm working on a documentary. And he says, um, well, you know, we don't like for people to take pictures and videos of the plants. And um, I said, well, well, I'm doing it. So I don't really know what else to say. And he says, you need to pack up your stuff and leave. It's like, okay, well, am I on public property or private property? I'm standing on the road. Meanwhile, my mom's in the car going, get in the car, get in the car. <laughs> and eventually, you know, whatever, I relinquish, I pack up my stuff and I leave. And I'm leaving with this question of what is significant about this? Like, what is there to hide at 7 a.m. in the morning? Um, so much so that 37 seconds into, you know, pressing the record button, uh, these guys show up in suits and hard hats. What's the deal? And so, um, so naturally, I start asking more questions about petrochemical in my interviews. The next week at work, Justin sends me this article in The Atlantic, and Anya's written it. And so, um, and so I wanted to interview her for the documentary. So that's, uh, so, so really, um, so really I was the first to reach out and then she reached back out to me later on. Um, and so just to back up real, uh, real quick and talk about Ayers property. And so Sidonia Dennis, we, knew, we know that she didn't know how to read or write um, because I'm pulling records at the courthouse and next to her name, there's an X. You know, there's, there's the same X next to her name. So my guess is that she signed her name with an X. She didn't know how to read or write. Um, the census also confirms that. Uh, and, you know, the story goes based on who you're related to, um, which, so there's a land deed in 1923. That is the original deed. My great grandfather's on that deed as well as one of his brothers, who's the oldest. There's a second deed from, um, 1958 that has seven males listed um, as, um, as, as co-owners to the property. Of course, that comes out a year after the first oil, gas, and mineral lease is taken out on the property. And so we're seeing more names suddenly appear like, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've got a piece of that pie too. Um, and then there's Louisiana state law, which is the oddest thing to me. Um, I suppose it's, I don't know much about law, um, but I do know that, um, because of the codes, Napoleonic code, things operate a bit differently down there. And so, um, so you know, you could, you can, you you have rights uh, if you pay taxes on the property. So these houses and a couple more beyond the um, the shot there. Um, not everyone's in the family who lives on the property. You know, over 30 years ago, so and so didn't have a place to live. So you know, you can move your trailer here and live. They're co-owners now as well. Um, simply because they're paying taxes. So when the question of oil comes up um, and you've got three separate groups who say, hey, we own it too, we own it too, we own it too. It's just, it's a recipe for disaster at bare minimum, a um, bit of an argument. And so um, at this point, this is just, these are just interviews. This is just me talking to people. And I thought, what are the chances that I go to the courthouse and just do some digging myself? So I show up. I go to the clerk of court. Um, it's still the pandemic, so I had the gift of time to do some of this research. And um, they point me in the direction to uh, a room over called the, the conveyance room. And so um, I don't know about anyone in here. I was not familiar with the conveyances before I walked into that room but giant library full of books that go back to 1809. And these are your, your property transfers from buyer to seller, se seller to buyer. They're all in alphabetical order. Um, go back to the front room, say, could you, I need some wayfinding here. They're like, you're on your own. We are not here to help you with your little project. Good luck. And so, so I just cracked a book open because, um, you know, overwhelmed. And I mean, 
months before this moment, I'm just finding out about this woman named Sidonia Dennis, 1862, these random facts. When you, when you don't know your history and you open up a book that you've never heard before, a conveyance, and this is the first thing that you see, it's like Jumanji. It's like the room started to shake. Um, it's, you know, um, it, it was mind blowing to me um, that in the property records, all property transfers um, are, document, are documented in Louisiana anyways. And so um, from the same book that I could pull the original chain of title, I could pull every sale of slave record um, on Jones land, on surrounding properties, which Sidonia Dennis was enslaved um, on, let's see, there's the Arsenault's and then the Gagne plantation, two plots of land over. Um, you can pull all this stuff. And so, you know, three and a half years later in the process, um, which, uh, which was a couple of, which was two months ago, it occurred to me, I've done all of this talking and all of this research and conducted all these interviews with family members, but I'd never gotten the chance to share back um, where, you know, the, the, the fruit that their interviews led to. You know, I hadn't gotten to share back um, the research that I'd found. So during my last visit, I um, got to share some of this stuff back. You know, how infuriating and complicated and awful is it to grow up in a place that is this significant, right? Um, and to have ancestors grow up in this place to be rooted down, it's your ancestral land, and not an ounce of it taught um, in your school, um, to have public records, which I didn't even talk about, um, be so inaccessible, um, right? Because I had to dig for this. At some point, I, I actually kind of had to fight for it, especially after being told to leave the courthouse, um, which happened. Um, and so, and so, yeah, that it, it blows my mind. Um, it blows my mind. And I, I just want to say, I think that it's also part of that process of extraction that people would not know their own history, that you could live literally on the land that your family has lived on for that long. And, and it's plantation country, that's what people call it. And that you'd be that um, like divorced from your own history. One way of thinking about extraction is like the, the process of segregation, right? It's like segregating minerals and oil from their habitat, from their environment, segregating agricultural land from the forest, segregating people from, from natural spaces, segregating black people from white people, segregating people from their history. So it's, you know, I don't think it's um, accidental that that history which is which is so clearly in the landscape um, is also not taught. So we're gonna. I, so for me, I, the question that kept coming up as I was doing research is like, why, why plantations and petrochemical plants? And so I started looking at these plantation maps, and I'm, I'm seeing nodding. I think probably many of you have seen this one before. But this is the Mississippi River, and there's the plantations are. Um, mapped along and there's some things to notice about the way that the plantations are laid out along the river um, if you think about what it is that they the you know these plantation owners were valuing most one is river access so the Mississippi River has some of the busiest shipping channels in the world right so if you're growing sugar you want to be able to get that sugar out and sell it so river access was expensive. So you'll see they're like these skinny little plots where they have their river access and their dock, and then they go way back because they want to also have land to grow, right? The third thing that they needed was a state government that was willing to sponsor this very violent labor practice, right? So Louisiana um, is absolutely supportive of it. So then if you start looking at where the petrochemical plants are, so all of those yellow dots, that's where the, the plantations are. All of the red dots are where the petrochemical plants are, are located now. So this is just between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. So it gives you a sense of how many there are um, as well. But what does a petrochemical plant need in order to function? One, it needs river access, right? 
Two, it needs a lot of land. And then three, it needs a state that's willing to overlook the violence of the industry, right? The health burden of the industry. So in a lot of ways, it really makes sense that they're, you know, that they're very much in the same place. So after emancipation, a lot of, um, you know, enslaved people basically had like three choices, right? They could try and leave. They could become sharecroppers, and, and choice is probably not the right word, right? Because there weren't choice, but there's sort of three, three directions people went. And then some people who were very lucky were able to get some land, whether it was through a Freedmen's Bureau um, grant or some other land grant opportunity or because of some, some relationship like bartering that they were able to do. Some people had um, land even prior to emancipation. Some people didn't get it till much later. Jazzy's family got it in 1923, um, which is incredible at the height of Jim Crow to be able to get that land, but a lot of those la land, because reparations did not happen, right? So the, the bits of land they got were these long, skinny plots that went back from the river. So there'd be black-owned land that was relatively small right next to plantation land, right? These big sugar plantations. So as petrochemical industries started looking for places, they realized they could buy this land from basically the, the descendants of plantation owners, and it was still all together. It hadn't been divvied up. You know, if you think about what would have happened in this region if reparations had taken place, if this was black land that had been, you know, was owned by multiple people, it would have been so much harder to access that land. But because it was still held by the same families, they were able to buy up large swaths of land. And so what happened is this pattern along the river of petrochemical plant, black community, petrochemical plant, black community, all along the river. Um, and some of those black communities are still thriving. Some of them have been bought out because they, there have been explosions. There have been, um, people have died. There have been, you know, like vinyl chloride um, leaching into the ground. So some of them have been bought out. Some of them still exist. But I think it's really important to think there is a map that's missing right here, and that is the map of all the black free towns along the river. Um, and there's a reason that that map is missing. Because when people were forming these free towns, they were often unincorporated. You know, if you think about what priorities were in that moment, getting incorporated and having a relationship with government is probably not high on your list. Um, you don't even want people to know where you are, right? Um, and so those, those, the legacy of that today is that this land is black free towns are, are very, very vulnerable to, um, to predatory practices, whether they're getting annexed by white spaces or annexed by, um, by petrochemical industries or just being in proximity to them. Um, heirs property, if one person, you know, you think about a family like Jazzy's where there's like 3,000 descendants who are alive today. If one person decides they wanna sell their share of that property, the rest of the property goes up for sale by law. So um, heirs property is incredibly vulnerable and heirs property is mostly owned by black people, right? So, so there's a lot of different ways in which this kind of pattern can happen. But I, I wanna stress that because it's not just like a long river road where there's so many um, of these black founded towns, they're, they're literally everywhere um, and they're unmapped and, they, and it's, like a, it's like a local history that I think we, we all need to be um, unearthing all the time. And I just wanted to show this is another image um, from above of what the petro petrochemical plants look like. As you can imagine, um, like Hurricane Ida tearing through that, what the, what the repercussions are of something like that. So um, there's just two more things I wanted to say. One is um, I think probably some folks in this audience have heard the definition of racism as state-sanctioned proximity to premature violence. You know, if you're living next to a petrochemical plant, that is, that is exactly what that is. And one of the ways that that is sanctioned is, um, is through land use plans, right? So zoning. So in St. James Parish, where Jazzy's family lives and where the Formosa plant was gonna um, be, the fourth and fifth districts are the primarily black districts in the, in the community. Um, those districts were, in 2014, they were zoned Listen, this is a very weird zoning category. They were zoned residential slash future industrial. And if you think about what that means, like the purpose of zoning is to separate residences and commercial areas from, from industry, right? But if you're zoning something future industrial, 
it's a racial cleansing document. I mean, it's literally planning for the erasure of the community that lives there at that time. And I will say that, that right now there's a, there's a court case that um, we just started like February or March of this year. March. March, yeah, where they're, um, they're actually, people are suing, a bunch of organizations are coming together to sue the parish council in St. James Parish because of this racist land use plan. Um, and one of, the, one of the legal doctrines that's propping it up is the 13th Amendment, right? Which is the amendment that abolished slavery because they're saying people in this region are not actually having access to health um, and property in the same way that other people are having access to it. And if you're not, if you're, um, if, if you look at the parish as a whole, there are a lot of predominantly white districts in the parish. Um, and I will say everybody is exposed to these chemicals. It's, you know, the chemicals do not discriminate. They just, you know. Mm -hmm. they, they, they don't stop at the parish line. Right, mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> but there, there were petrochemical plants that were going to be built in the white districts and they were successfully stopped by community members. Community members are absolutely just as invested in stopping them in the fourth and fifth, fifth districts. Um, and there's currently there's 12 in in those two small districts um, and there's still more that they're like they just stopped Formosa and now there's another one that's that's trying to expand so we can go and go but I think Are that we, we should time? open up for um, oh yes we Q and A yeah yeah, yeah.